Welcome, gentle listener. Before we continue, I would implore you to listen to my first entry concerning Rugal Dawn, the Praetorian of Terror. Without the context therein contained, I feel you would be robbing yourself of the impact of the information that is presented here. But as always, I am at your disposal. Also, I would have it noted, gentle listener, that I have omitted so much as to make a veteran of the setting enraged. But do remember that this is an introduction only, and not an attempt to encapsulate the entirety of the events to which Rogel Dawn was party, nor an attempt to explain the entirety of the drama. For there are many perspectives, so much information, that people retreat into the world of Warhammer for months, years, and even decades as a refuge from the vicissitudes of the world. As I stated in my previous entry for Rogel, it is the very appeal of the Warhammer universe. Its scope. Its depth. So, let us continue the tale of the greatest story of the Warhammer 40k universe. The reason it is loved so deeply. Its very soul. I speak not of Rogel Dawn specifically, but of the dreaded moment. The darkest point in this fictional world. What I call the longest second, which is contained herein. First, let us paint the scene. We left it with Rogel on Terra, Earth, the birthplace of humanity. But let us familiarize ourselves with the cast of players, the stars of the dark drama that is about to unfold. For without this knowledge we cannot appreciate the man of whom I speak, Rogel, and the titanic struggle which he faced, practically alone. We know that there were twenty Primarchs, but two had passed from history before he had the rebellion of Horus forever afterwards called the Horus Heresy, began. Eight fell to chaos and sided with Horus, making a full half of the total number of the Legiones Astartes, the Space Marines. First, we shall discuss those Primarchs and their legions that remained faithful. Nine should have been loyal, so why was Rogel so outnumbered and alone? The simple truth is that Horus Lupercal fell to evil far before he raised his treacherous banners on Istvan V, years before. While invested with the power and authority of Warmaster, High Lord and General of all of the forces of the Emperor, Horus plotted, schemed and planned. He knew which Primarchs and by dint of this, their legions, that would never recant their loyalty to their father, the master of mankind, the Emperor. So, knowing full well of his inevitable need to rebel openly, he prepared. Oh, long did he prepare before he turned the colour of his cloth. We know that he schemed to destroy a large segment of the Loyalist armies by deed of ambush, as I have related at the betrayal of Istvan V, the Dropside Massacre, where full three Loyalist legions were shattered. The legions destroyed with the Iron Hands, sons of Ferris Manus, who was slain. The Salamanders, sons of Vulcan, and the Raven Guard, the sons of Corvus Corax. But that left six more. So in the months and years before he raised his banners and proclaimed himself, Horus contrived to send them to places so far flung or dangerous that they would not be able to stop him when the final deed was realized. Reboot Gilliman, the Primarch of the most numerous and most organized legion, the Ultramarines, was sent as far to the Galactic East as Horus could send him without raising suspicion. But more than this, he also was led into a trap, 
played by Lorga. Lehman Ross, the wolf lord and self-professed emperor's executioner who led the Vulcan Fenrica, the Space Wolves. Also was sent far field, but we know he returned to Terra, but then went on a rampage and was secluded and harried until he was unable to support Rogel. Lion L. Johnson, the Lion, the Primarch of the First Legion, the Dark Angels, was sent to the Galactic North. For the Lion was a dire threat to Horus and his rebellious brothers, as he was a natural genius in the arts of war, his legion the most lauded after only the sons of Horus. He was sent as far away as Horus could practically get away with. Horus, like all of the Primarchs, had a natural fear of the lion on an instinctive level. He was neutralized thus as the highest priority. Sanguinius, the angel and Primarch of the Ninth Legion, the Blood Angels. Horus knew this particular brother was also a dire threat to any rebellion, and Horus connived to send him into a trap again in the Galactic North. But for the full tale of the trap, we will have to wait until I can perform an entry for this, the most loved of all Primarchs. Ferus Manus was dead. Vulcan was missing, presumed dead also. Corvus Corax's legion was a shadow of its power, denuded of numbers after the Dropside Massacre. Despite Corvus's attempt to artificially increase his numbers through cloning, he was betrayed again by the Alpha Legion, and he failed. Thus Rogel asked him, the master of the raid and surprise attack, to skirt the oncoming juggernaut of the traitors and attack their supply lines. Thus it was that Corvus played merry hell with the rear of the traitor advance, but never enough to do more than slow them and annoy them with constant inconvenience. Horus knew his craft and had prepared for all eventualities. This left only Jagatai and his white scars and Rogal Dawn and his imperial fists to fight the traitors. But there were so many of them, so well led, so many Primarchs in the field, so many forces that had turned. But let us explore them now, the legions of evil, the cohorts of chaos, so we can grasp the magnitude of Rogel's heroism, for any human must be judged by the caliber of their opposition, and oh, what opposition Rogel had to contend with. The Forces of Evil Lorgar Aurelian, the Primarch of the Word Bearer's Legion, who is known as the First Traitor, accredited with being the spider behind the scenes that facilitated the fall of the Warmaster. Lorgar had turned to chaos years before Horus. He was sent to the worlds of Ultramar, the home of the Ultramarines, and met with them as a friend, only to turn on them in a well-laid ambush on the world of Kalth. The attempt was to do unto the Ultramarines what the traitors had done at the drop site massacre. But though the word bearers attacked with fury and completely unlooked for, the Ultramarines were more organized and ever prepared, and the projected massacre instead turned into a battle, a battle that Reboot was winning. Angron, dubbed by many as the Red Angel, the Primarch of the World Eaters, who was sent with Lorgar to the east and performed surprise raids on the worlds of Ultramar, the home of Reboot Gilliman and his Ultramarines, while they were waylaid at Kalth. Angron visited a high toll from the worlds of Ultramar, but was soon pushed back by the well-organized and professional forces of the Ultramarines. Lorgar then enacted a huge dark ritual that summoned a warp storm called the Ruin Storm in history and cut the galactic east off from Holy Terror. Thus were the Ultramarines and Reboot unable to answer the call to Terror, because they did not hear it. So dire were things that Reboot Gilliman actually believed that Horus had already won, and the Emperor was already dead. Thus, 
He did not even look to Terra until later. Conrad Kurz, called the Night Haunter, Primarch of the Night Lords, was playing a strange game with his loyalist brothers on the other side of the Ruined Storm. But that is for another time. Alpharius and Omegon, the twin Primarchs and Lords of the Alpha Legion, were not with Horus's main thrust, but we should get to them in due course. Fulgrim, Primarch of the Emperor's Children, who, over the time of the Rebellion, not only fell to evil, but became a demon prince, infused with the power of the Dark Gods, and twisted out of all recognition in the service of the God Slanesh, the Lord of Excess. Mortarion, Primarch of the Death Guard, also became a thing of horror, and he also became a demon prince, but this time to the service of the god Nurgle, the Lord of Decay. Puturabo, Primarch of the Iron Warriors, who had an enduring hatred of Rogal Dawn and all of his sons, the Imperial Fists. Magnus the Red, Primarch of the Thousand Sons, who had also been transformed into a terrifying apparition of evil, a demon prince of Zinch, the Lord of Change. All did as instructed by Horus, well, within limits. Their combined legions inexorably ground forward, crushing all resistance in their path. Eventually, they all met with the arch-traitor, the warmaster Horus Lupercal, on the world of Alanor Prime the very site where Horus had been elevated to Warmaster. From there, they moved forward into the last phase of their campaign, the attack on the Soul System, the heart of the Imperium, where Terra was. This may have seemed like the beginning of a biblical book, the unending names, but I wish to update you on the situation and, more importantly, to graphically outline the forces arrayed against Rogel as the unofficial war master of the Royalist armies. Each Primarch was a titan of war, a genius, a charismatic leader and a terror. Every single one of them. Yet Rogel held them back delaying them with endless energy, tactical brilliance, and unquenchable zeal. He did this for seven years. Imagine that. To fight against the most experienced warriors the human race had ever seen, trained by the Emperor for decades, if not centuries longer than Rogel or any of his brothers. Yet Rogel Dawn had these forces at bay for over half a decade. He never tired. He never succumbed to grief. He never gave in to despair. No matter how many times he lost, no matter how many times he was pushed back. Jagatai was with him, and at points also Lehman Russ, but none had the huge weight of command on their shoulders. Everything that went wrong, every defeat, every setback was laid at the feet of Rogel, Yet he never once lost faith. Rogel was playing a game of chess against his brother, Horus. But Horus had nine queens to Rogel's two, and thrice the number of pawns, knights, bishops, and rooks. Phenomenal courage. But in all of this, where was the master of mankind? Where was the emperor, I hear you ask? Alas, the full story we cannot hope to cover here, but in brief. He had returned to Earth to create his own webway, a method of travel that would not be reliant on the warp, and that was so infested with the demons and other enemies of humanity, he was trying to secure the greatest safety of humanity and negate the need for travel via the warp as he remembered the age of strife all night and how warp storms had almost destroyed the human race. Thus he was attempting to create a transit system that would forever remove the need for any human to be exposed to that horrible dimension. He was building for the future, 
as he so trusted that Horus and his brothers would continue the Great Crusade and bring peace and freedom to humanity. He had expected the outcome to be foregone, or he would never have retreated from active leadership of the Crusade. More is the pity. It is a complicated story, which we will explore more in other notes. But Magnus, before he turned to evil, attempted to warn his father of the rebellion of Horus. But in doing so, he burst the wards, the mystic psychic shields that the Emperor had erected around his palace to protect his Webbe project. When this happened, the warp flooded into his subrealm. The gateway to the warp that was to be the first door into his new webway was left open, and all of the powers of chaos sent lesion after lesion of foul beings, the Neverborn, their demons, to try to crush the Emperor and use his own gateway to invade the Immaterium, the real world, on the ground of terror itself. Thus, the Master of Mankind had no choice but to exert all of his energy and bend all of his will and godlike psychic powers to fending off the endless tide of evil that assailed his very hearth, the Palace on Terror. The majority of his bodyguard, his custodies, who were even more powerful in combat than Space Marines, were with him in this sub-realm attempting to hold the line. Thus, he could not break his concentration, his great exertion, for even an instant to assist his son, Rogel, in his labours. I will note now that there is an important figure I am leaving out of this recounting, along with many events and nuances, that of Malkador the Sigilite. But for his history again, we must wait for his own entry. He did his best to assist Rogel, but the burden of the war was not on his shoulders, and not at his command. A psyker of almost limitless power though he was, he was not a Primarch, and could not offer Rogel the support that he most needed. So we can see that Rogel fought on. I can honestly state that there are few deeds in any mythology, fiction or fable, that can come even close to the magnitude of the bravery, tenacity or genius exhibited by Rogel, despite it being a constant string of defeats. Those defeats exacted a tithe of blood from the traitors that they could scarce even imagine. But it got worse. Despite the pain of the rebellion to Rogel, the situation got much worse. While he tried to outthink, outmaneuver, and outgeneral a plethora of his brothers, his very rear was assailed. In the stage left, Alpharius and his Alpha Legion. Alpharius and Omegon, the only twin Primarchs, had been the last to be found by the Great Crusade, and very late in the day. So much so that the Emperor left his training to Horus. So it was to Horus that they were both loyal. Alpharius and Omegon were the little brothers to all of the Primarchs. They had been found so late. As such, they could never hope to accrue the accolades and glories that others had accrued over two centuries or more of the Great Crusade. And what is more, the Alpha Legion under Alpharius and Omegon were very unlike the other legions. They acted subtly and with secrecy, manipulation and guile. Where most of the other legions fought directly, many derided the Alpha Legion and their lords for being cowardly and capricious, but Alpharius gained results all right. Alas, Alpharius was to prove to be a terrible thorn in the side of the loyalists when he finally revealed himself. His legion had been sent earlier than any other and had prepared the way. Alpharius activated sleeper units all across the Sol system and brought about pandemonium. Rogel had to contend with so much already, but ever did the sleeper units of Alpharius cause carnage, instability and mayhem wherever they activated. More than this, they shook the very spirit of the loyalist soldiery. For the Alphas made them question the ability of Rogel, and burned, bombed, or sabotaged where the hurt would be most. The hurt most often targeted was the very image of Rogel Dawn and his ability and his authority. 
It was not only that. Alpharius made it so personal. He even went so far as to inform Rogel that he had informants in the palace itself. How, you may ask? In the investory, a huge hall in the inner sanctum of the palace, there once stood twenty statues, each a perfect likeness of the twenty Primarchs. Two were destroyed when the Primarchs fell from grace and their history was expunged from all record, at the command of the Emperor himself. And they are the greatest secret of the Warhammer universe, and not in thirty years has it categorically been stated what happened to them. There are theories. Alpharus' spies blew up all but two of the statues, one being himself, Alpharius, the second being Rogal Dawn, a declaration of war, and also an attempt to unsettle and intimidate Rogal, if not the warrior within him, Dawn. But he may as well have been spitting in the wind. Rogal fought for something he could never understand let alone appreciate. Rogel fought for a dream that clearly even baffled Alpharius. His adversaries continued to underestimate Rogel at every turn, to their later regret, all of them. Rogel also knew that it meant something even more terrible. It meant that Horus had turned years before Rogel knew. Horus had been planning this great betrayal for years. How oh, this must have hurt Rogel, to know he may even have had communication with his brother when he was already a traitor in his heart, if not by proclamation. It is a wonder that Rogel was not driven mad by the combination of grief, strain and constant defeat. For any other Primarch, even Horus, it would have been too much. Yet Rogel stood proud. No matter the reality of the situation staring him in the face, the inevitability of his defeat, he still believed. Rogel believed that if he just held out long enough, fought hard enough, exacted enough of a blood price from the traitors, that either they would break and fall upon one another, as all traitors and the faithless always do eventually, or that more of his loyalist brothers would come to his aid in the defense of their father. Every day, he knew was a day closer to the moment when the lion, the angel or a boot may arrive. If he could just hold on. Nor was Rogel permitted a moment's respite. Even when there was a temporary break in the direct hostilities, as the traitors rallied for another sally. For in these moments he was either dealing with the actions of Alpharius, or he was performing another task he found odious in the extreme. Rogel was a master of defensive war and fortification, no matter how much Petarabo may claim otherwise. He was plying his trade to the highest level he had ever done. He dug deep. Rogel was making the soul system a death trap of overlapping fire concentric circles of defenses. But his least favorite task was the marring of the Emperor's palace. Over centuries, the palace on Terra had been crafted into a thing of sublime beauty and a testament not only to the power of the Emperor, but the creativity, glory and beauty possible within the heart of humanity. How Rogel hated to mar it with iron and granite and steel. Colonnades of beautiful marble were replaced with gun emplacements and death traps. Warrens of previously scintillating, tessellated mosaic were replaced with traps and hard points. Rogel never betrayed his feelings to those around him. But how he must have wanted to weep for the marring of the work of thousands. The shining beacon of human endeavor that was now replaced with a glorified bunker. Finally, as the forces of Horus mustered on Ulanor, Alpharius came out into the open. He had powered down a vast fleet of his ships. His men, in stasis, 
so they could not be detected by any of Rogel's many listening outposts and scanners, and simply used the tides of space to drift him past the defences of Rogel. He was within the net. The Alpha Legion Armada then powered up and began a raid on a fundamentally important position in the outer Sol system. On a moon of Pluto called Hydra, Alpharius was assailing the astropathic choir when he learned to his regret that again he had underestimated Rogel Dawn. When the fleet of traitors had simply materialized within his defenses, Dawn reacted with lightning organization and led a scrambled fleet to stop him. The traitors had intended to strike and fade, as was the way of the Alpha Legion, but Rogel Dawn was a master of void combat, that is, war in space. Dawn slung shot his reactionary fleet around multiple celestial bodies and arrived to catch Alpharius in their act. Without hesitation, Dawn assessed the situation and his fleet attacked. Rogel Dawn received reports that the traitor Primarch was personally leading a force of his elite Terminators into the very heart of the, of the station on Hydra, and Dawn intervened. Dawn appeared and found his brother in the act of slaughtering Imperial Fist defenders. The last to be found, he may have been, but he was a Primarch, and none save another Primarch could face one. So Dawn engaged him in close combat. The battle was fierce, and some say that it was only the act of an Imperial Fist grabbing the haft of the spear Alpharius had aimed at the hearts of Dawn that spared him. But the upshot was that Dawn took the strike on an unimportant segment of his body armor. Dawn, in one fluid movement, cut his brother's hands off, slashed Alpharius across the chest, then took Alpharius' spear and rammed it into him. Dawn then took his mighty chainsword, Storm's teeth, and embedded it into Alvarius' skull, ending him instantly. The Alpha Legion retreated swiftly, and from that point on almost removed themselves from direct action, and merely provided information to Horus and the Traitor Command. But this was enough. Alpharius may have died in his raid, but he had discerned every last echelon of the defenses Rogel had spent years constructing, and had already sent it to the War Master. Horus would know every last hard point, every last battery, sight and sinew at the defenses of Terra and the Sol system. Dawn, the part of the man that was a demigod of battle, strategist and War Master, was the one who executed Alpharius without missing a heartbeat. Perhaps it was the months of frustration, terrorist attacks, the open challenge, the rage, he could not take out on Horus and the other traitors. It was the first time Rogel Dorn had seen one of his foes in person, and the rage, built up over more than half a decade of horror, was white hot. Perhaps Rogel might have mourned his brother, but he did not get the time nor space to even consider the brother he had never spent any time with, or built any bond with. Dorn knew that Horus Lupercal was on his way and all the legions of hell were in his wake. And this is when the heavens opened and the sun shone, for beyond all hope, a fleet arrived in the outer system one that was loyal. The fleet that made its way at maximum speed toward Terra and made contact. But not any fleet, not any Legion, not just any Primarch. Dawn took the notification with stern compose of all those who could have arrived. To Rogel, this must have been a dream come true a balm to that so very weary soul. Of all that could have come, all that could have helped, his secret wish must have been for it to be this one. He had made it through the ruined storm. It was the Blood Angels. And on board was the one Primarch who could have made Rogel sing with joy, if that was his way. It was his beloved, most trusted, most respected brother, 
It was the angel himself. At last, Sanguinius had come. Rogel was no longer alone. They would face Horus and his vile scum together. Sanguinius was here. When they met, it was a somber occasion, as the two other would not be possible for Dawn. But how he must have felt the weight, the burden, lift ever so slightly. For if anyone could bring hope back to the beleaguered men, women, children, Oterra, and even the war-weary Astartes of the Imperial Fists, it was the Angel. Like a bright star he blazed, and Rogel started to believe again. Just a little. Enough to go on. Enough to make those traitors pay. They may not live, they may not prevail. But with Sanguinius next to him, Rogel could make a good end of it. He would fight. Even the warrior within, Dawn, must have quietly rejoiced. For none could steady the lines of the loyalist armies. None other could make them believe again as well. The angel had come, and he had brought his entire legion with him. The blood angels, the warriors of the Emperor's own wrath. The Imperial Fists would stand, but by their side would be the very manifestation of the Emperor's rage. Those traitors were in for a real fight now. Perhaps long enough for the lion or the wolf or the ultramarines to arrive. Perhaps, if they fought hard enough, just perhaps. But scant time did they have before the inevitable began anew, and their forces of the traitors were detected. The armada of the traitors reached the Sol system and went about their onward plunge towards Terra itself. All the defenses of Rogel were swept away, one by one, in detail, for Horus knew of them all, thanks to Alpharius and Omegon, but despite all of the knowledge and forewarning he had, the casual raid amongst the traitor fleet was eye-watering. If anything but the Emperor himself were not the target, then the traitors would have disengaged. The rings around Terra, the loyalist navy, the batteries on Luna, and every satellite, asteroid, and everything in between was arranged by Rogel Dawn to punish the rebels and punish them it did. Nor was their advance swift. For thirty days, the fleet was held at bay and cut to ribbons for its troubles. Horus and his brothers had to witness hundreds upon hundreds of their ships, a full quarter of their fleet, burned, blasted, and crushed. But on they came nonetheless. On to terror. The moment that the traitor fleet was in range, the bombardment began. Plasma and missiles, nuclear and chemical, rained down on the Imperial Palace and the whole of Terra. The birthplace of humanity, the centre of the Imperium, was hit by a deluge of mass and corruption, destruction and death. The likes had never been seen before, even during the worst years of the Unification Wars. The traitors unleashed hell and maintained this assault for days on end. Finally, when they had achieved what they set out to do, destroy as many defenses as possible, and so discord, confusion, terror, and death, did the firing cease and the landing begin. Drop pods. Think of a missile that strikes, and then instead of exploding, power-armored marines would run out, fill the skies, streaking towards the ground in their thousands. When this horror began, the sleeper units of Alpharius, those that were left, leapt into action and activated across the entire globe. In mere hours, 
The traitor marines were amongst the streets and the fences of terror. They massed and assaulted the two spaceports closest to the Imperial Palace, the Eternity Wall and Lion's Gate Spaceports. Once secured, the heavens were filled with transports filled to the brim with the mortal armies of Horus. But one could not call them normal anymore. No, far from it. As the forces of the traitors arrived, they again lost eye-watering large proportions of their men and material, as Rogal Dawn's defenses and lasers, missiles and plasma, rose up to cut them from the skies in their swathes. Debris rained across Earth, terror, all with the blood of once loyal soldiers of the Imperium on them. But land in their millions, they still did. Titans, forty or more meter tall colossi of war, were landed as well. Much of the force then gathered before the very gates of the palace, cavorting, laughing, and in high spirits, despite the tithe exacted from them. None cared for their own dead, and all salivated at the chance to run amok in the very home of the master of mankind. Rogel and Sanguinius would hold the palace. Jagatai, that lord of fast strike and savage raid, would be deployed beyond the walls. Also, because the White Scars would not do their best work on walls or parapets, Rogel knew where to deploy his brother to the best effect, and thus he unleashed the Khan to do what he did best. Jagatai and his mighty White Scars would punish the traitors with swift strikes and undermine their deployment, harrying them wherever they left even a millimeter gap. A move that proved to be well made. For though Horus made his fangs unassailable, the great Khan found a gap and punished the traitors mightily. He later retook the Lion Gate spaceport and turned its guns on the incoming traitors and exacted a high price from them. Dragatai did move on the Eternity port, but was repelled. All the while he was harrying the forces of Horus, he was making sure they never had an easy time. He slew many in the name of the Emperor. But for now we must concentrate on the defense of the palace. More will be revealed during his own video. Rogel was a whirlwind of orders, a flurry of control and direction, as he overwatched the defenses not only of the palace, but of the entire planet of Terra. As a loyalist war master, he had to direct the entire defense. Thus it was his brother, Sanguinius who manned the walls of the palace. But he saw, and what he saw must have revolted him on every level. Where the traitor armies had previously been entire sectors or systems away, they had been a foe to battle, but not a view. Now Rogel could see exactly what they had become. As the forces of chaos for they were not just rebel Astartes and soldiers anymore, massed before the walls of the palace. Rogel viewed them close up for the first time through his screens. The vile mutations, the twisted forms, the degeneration of once proud brothers in arms into creatures of nightmare. Amongst a throng of corrupted Mechanicus, the baying soldiery, and possessed demonic Astartes, Angron pushed forward. He was huge, and his inner hate was now clearly marked on his body, for he had become a demon prince, and now little remained of his semblance. He had not only given up on his humanity, he had become the very thing that the Great Crusade had striven against. A twisted thing of evil and surrounding them all with the worst demons and minions of the warp that had been summoned, endless tides poured forth by the vile rites of the thousand suns. So much for Magnus's innocence. These 
men showed Rogel and Sanguinius all that they needed to know about the poor, misguided son. The lesions of vileness were almost uncountable. Angron strode forward and bellowed at the defending warriors, stating that they were alone and without refuge, support or means of escape. He derided them and taunted that they should surrender now and beg for his mercy. The mortal soldiery would have cowered, the Statis been sapped of their resolve. Even the redoubtable and bluff Imperial Fists, but for his brother. Sanguinius stood atop the walls and sneered at Angron, his light and courage providing hope to all those who would have run. Sanguinius's mere presence, an example, was enough. Some say that he telepathically communicated with the horror that was previously Angron, but all it appeared to those around and below was one simple statement, a look that said it all. Bring it on, scum! Angron bellowed his laughter to the sky, and all around him knew that he relished the fight to come. But some say that he quietly quaked, for why else did he return to his lines instead of assailing the angel directly? Other reports state that the angel went out and sallied forth and fought Angron directly, but then retreated back behind the shielding of the wall. So many differing tales. Such an important moment. Rogel could see the lesions of his erstwhile comrades turn to unmistakable evil. They wore it with such pride. He could see representatives of so many lesions, yet he did not feel terror. He only felt his resolve strengthen, for nothing more than this sight could have told him without any doubt that he was on the side of light. So the battle was joined. A battle so in-depth and drawn out that I must only mention those parts most relevant to the story of Rogaldorn here. I hope to be able to cover this topic, this mighty clash of arms, from many angles. But today, let us speak of Rogel and his experience. Thrice were the enemy thrown back from the balls, but ever they came on. Punishment beyond count was dealt to them by the indomitable Imperial Fists and their wrathful Blood Angel brothers. But the tide of numbers was inexhaustible, and they were pushed back. For weeks, the battle raged. Weeks! Each time the traitors and their demon minions breached a barrier or defensive line, they believed it would be the last, that the will of the defenders would sour, and they would run amok at last. Only to find that Rogel Dawn had been so very busy in the years, that they had been winning battles. The overlapping fire arcs, the warrens of tunnels, the traps, the defences Dawn had erected can only be described with one word. Magnificent. Even so, they finally failed. A massed push by the enemy led to the central section of the defenders' line collapsing through attrition alone. For no blood angel or fist retreated from anything or anyone without specific orders from Rogel. The two legions would always be brothers like no other from this point on, or so they thought. But the line was broken, and there was but one gate left. The final gate into the palace's inner sanctum, the Eternity Gate. But Fist, Soldiery and Angels were trapped on the other side, and Rogel could not extricate them in time. They were in danger of being butchered. It was then that Rogel would have gone to the front himself to save them, to buy them time, for the gate had to be closed, it had to be. But Rogel desperately did not wish for his, or his men, brother's men, or those loyal humans who had fought so valiantly to be left to the hordes of evil. It was then that his brother, Sanguinius, took up his sword and spear again and strode forth. We do not know what was said, then, between these two close brothers, 
but Sanguinius would have stated what Dawn knew, that he, the Emperor's chosen war master, could not be the one. So Sanguinius went out to meet the hordes of evil, to buy time, the precious time needed for their flank forces to retreat into the inner palace. So Rugal was left behind to organize, to order, to watch the chevrons of his men and the blood angels moving toward the gates. But ever would his eye be flicking to the one screen that mattered the most, the one containing his brother, the angel, Sanguinius. And what a spectacle he saw that day. For in all of the annals of the human race, no martial display could compare. The forces of chaos could see their goal and their hackles were up, their mouths watering at the prospect of gaining the gate and cutting off the fists and blood angels outside. But more than this, every last one wished the glory and the perverse joy of being the first to get into the palace's entry. No small amount of them relished also the thought of killing the Emperor's pretty angel. So they threw all they had at him. As the clock ticked, the chevrons moved, the time passed. Dawn was concerned, more concerned than he had been before, as if the angel fell, it would open the gates to the enemy, but also the crushing effect on morale would be untenable. The angel had to succeed. Each man, soldier or Astartes, that passed the angel into the inner sanctum was one more chance, one more second, one more warrior to hold the line, one second closer to him giving the order to the allow the angel to stand down and for the great gates to be closed. For the man inside the armor, for Rogel, these were the longest moments of his life, he thought then. As every second ticked by, he witnessed his brother fighting as no human had ever fought. He was magnificent. Dawn knew he had to remain aloof, stoic, stable, for all those who watched. One whiff of panic, one single display of doubt or emotion, could have swept across his command staff like a tsunami. Belief. He had to project confidence and calm, all the while screaming inside. Not Sanguinius. Not him. As he watched, his brother give no quarter and no ground. Where a round would bounce off his artificer armor, Sanguinius let it hit. Where it would not, he evaded. He was shot at by endless adversaries, but was a blur of activity. When the enemy Astartes, twisted, possessed, or demons themselves, charged him in their throngs, Rogel's heart must have been in his throat. Yet always the angel prevailed. He pushed them back time and time again. Tens unto hundreds. He did it alone. And he did this for not minutes, but hours. Sanguinius held the gate alone for hours, but he ran out of time. As some of the last of the loyalists passed him, the palace itself shuddered. A footfall of such size and power that the very ground itself reverberated to its impact. A great wailing came from amongst the demons and traitors alike, obeying, heralding an oncoming victory. For one had come. The last thing Rogel would have wanted to see. To quote, A huge shape rose up amongst the armies of Horus. The creature was tall, taller than any around it, and as it rose up, it unfolded its great leathery wings and took to the air. It was a bloodthirster, greater demon of corn, the most fearsome and dangerous of the bloody gods' entourage. The demon flew towards Sanguinius 
and he recognized it instantly. Its name was Kabanda, and it had fought the creature before. End quote. Onwards he strode to meet the angel in the air and issued his challenge. Dawn stood impassive, but how Rogel must have wished to scream at the screen. Brother, get out! Get out of there! To Rogel's horror, Sanguinius strode forth and took to the air to meet the vile creature from the deepest depths of hell, to meet his onward rush. And in that moment he saw, as all did, both Chaos and Royalist, the microcosm of the macrocosm, good versus evil, light versus darkness, humanity against demon. The huge bulk of Kabanda came on with such force that none could fathom, none could understand how one man, for Sanguinius was a Primarch, an angel, but he was also a man, could face such a being and live. Rogel must have wanted to derelict his post, must have wanted to rush outside to help, to save his brother, to save the very hope of the Imperium, if Sanguinius were to fall. But the fury of the battle was locked, and he, as the dutiful son of the Emperor, his war master, had sworn to defend all of the Imperium. He could not move. He could not abandon his charges, the entire race, even for this hallowed son, this beloved brother. So he watched. He watched in terror. To quote, Atop the ultimate gate, two mighty figures clashed in aerial combat. Both were winged. The angel's wings were pure white and shone brightly through the smoke and smog of war. The other was a creature of nightmare, its demonic wings leathery and dark. As they wheeled above each other in the air, the warring troops below seemed to pause to watch the unfolding drama. Know this, creature of darkness. I will take my revenge on you for past evil said the angel, as he plunged his sword into the demon's face, spearing one of its eyes. The demon shrieked, as if in pain, but wheeled about lashing at the Primarch with its whip and chopping at him with its great axe. The demon's whip strung the Primarch's wing, and he faltered in the air slightly. As he did so, the bloodthirster grabbed him by the throat with its massive taloned fist. Sanguinius cut with his sword against the demon's flank, the beast flinched, but did not release. Now you are finished, pathetic little bird, rumbled the demon, and he threw the Primarch down onto the gate below. The granite stone splintered as the Primarch's body smashed into it. The traitor horde watching roared their approval. The Primarch lay still upon the broken stone as the demon landed next to him and prepared to deal the death blow. The monster's creature threw back its head and let loose a howl of exultation. Blood for the blood god, a skull for the skull throne. As the demon howled in triumph over him, Sanguinius drew up his last reserves of strength and power. With a massive effort, he painfully rose to face Cabanda for the last time. Your cry of victory is mistimed, demon. I am not finished. My vengeance has yet to be taken. I shall not fall at this hour, not in your bloodied hand. And at this, Sanguinius leapt the demon and seized it by the wrist and ankle, and he raised the beast high and smashed it down across his knee. The crack of its back breaking shook the masonry upon which they stood and echoed across the palace grounds. The hordes below watched in silence. Sanguinius, now terrible in his aspect, lifted the carcass of the demon above his head. An arc of power danced in his brow as he swung the body around and hurled the broken behemoth into the midst of the demon followers. The traitors beat their chests and wailed in dismay. The blood angels cheered, and the ultimate gate was shut. End quote. Thus did the gate close, and Rogel must have felt the most relief he had ever done in his life. For Sanguinius had survived, and had dealt a major wound 
to the morale of the animals that beset them. Thus it was the palace was held. And how long did all of this last? Rogel and Sanguinius inside, Jagatai outside. The battle had lasted for 55 days. 55 days. Against twice their number of Primarchs. Now infused with the power of the Dark Gods, some of them being demons unto themselves, evil augmenting their strength, with entire or part of six legions against a mere three. Yet Rogel had held them for fifty-five days. And so, gentle listener, the dreaded moment draws near.